let's go ahead and talk about the lower extremity. So talking about that lower body. And the good news is, guys, I already got to go through the first, like, 20 odd slides by myself because I once again clicked the wrong button. Hooray. So first thing we're talking about is that hip joint. Okay, so it turns out it's a ball and socket. We've got that head of the femur inside of our acetabulum that is giving us that ball and socket joint. Now it's incredibly stable because it turns out the acetabulum is deep. It's got a labrum and then a number of really thick ligaments that are gonna help keep us in that hip socket. So we're not gonna be able to dislocate. Now, the cartilage is really thick. We do have hydrostatic pressure, so literally some pressure that's helping keep that head inside of there. And then once again, we have a labrum that's even giving an extra level of padding. Now, since this is deeper than our glenoid fossa for the shoulder joint, turns out we're not gonna have as good of mobility at our hip compared to the mobility that we're gonna naturally find at the shoulder joint. But we're also gonna have much greater force production capabilities. Now, those three ligaments that we're going to have wrapping around the iliofemoral, the ischiofemoral, and the pubofemoral, they are going to be named after which bone they're being linked into, and they're going to be literally winding up as we extend the hip. So getting ourselves into from a, from a seated to standing position so that it literally helps twist it into the socket giving us more stability when we're in extension, so standing up. Now, we then are going to find that we have a number of bursa. These are effectively fluid-filled sacs that help pad the ligaments, tendons, and muscles to a certain extent around our bones in order to allow things to move with a little bit less friction and a little bit more ease. Now, the femur, is going to be the longest and in theory strongest bone in the human body. Now, don't get me wrong, you can break the femur, but you gotta definitely be doing some work in order to make that happen. However, it has a structural weakness in that the femoral shaft is pretty damn strong, but then it has the neck and then the head that is what goes obviously into your acetabulum. That neck is the weak point because it's made up of only trabecular bone, which is not as strong as the cortical bone. This is where, when they say someone broke their hip, it's typically the femoral neck that they're breaking. And that's why with the hip replacement, it's actually replacing the femoral neck and head by literally cutting off the top of the femur and then putting a spike into the, the shaft of the femur, specifically where the bone marrow is, and then having the artificial neck and head going in. Uh, this is also what Bo Jackson broke as just a 20-something-year-old while playing professional football that effectively didn't end his career, well, ended his football career, and then he only played professional baseball afterwards. And if you're not familiar with Bo Jackson and you got a lot of time right now, I suggest watching the 30 for 30 Bo Knows. Now, the pelvis itself is actually made up of technically three different bones. The ilium, which is going to be that iliac crest, so that's going to be the higher part that goes in front, the pubis, which is going to be the pubic symphysis bone, the one going in front, and then our ischium, which is going to be what is happening, or is the posterior and inferior component of our hip bone. Now, this is allowing us to go ahead and put our hip in a position to produce more force and be able to absorb force accordingly, depending on what activities we're trying to do. It's a lot more stable than we talk about our shoulder girdle where we have the scapula that can move around dynamically, which also influences the motion of the clavicle, but obviously is going to be used in conjunction with our shoulders. So there's the example, and I really like how you can see literally how deep the acetabulum is for the hip socket over here. But then notice this iliac crest is going to be where we're getting, or getting attachment for things like our glute medius, for things like our glute maximus, which is why we have such a good mechanical advantage. And then when we're looking at our ischium and our pubis, we can see where we're going to go ahead and have our attachments for the muscles of our, uh, effectively our adductors, along with our hamstrings. Now, pelvic tilt is literally which way we're tilting the pelvis, okay? Um, would it help if I lower the camera so you guys could literally see what I'm trying to do with my legs? Or do you guys prefer not to have to 
see my workout shorts. All right, well, it seems like nobody cares. So we're just gonna keep powering on forward. Ain't that right, Tinker Stinker? All right, so the way that we're going to, whatever is easier. Guys, no offense, I already know this. I'm just talking to myself. And then though it is kind of fun is my cat just decided to show up and headbutt the blinds because she is a smart one, if you can see her. No, 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 no. Yeah, she, she eats the blinds. It's like we don't feed her. Okay, so when we are standing up, okay, so put your hands on your hip and stand up if you guys can where you're at. And then I want you to think about leaning your hips forward. That is anterior pelvic tilt, okay? Now, when we talk about femoral movement, extension of the hip is gonna be pushing your leg behind you. Okay, so if you think about anterior, so we're shifting the hips forward and extending the hip, it's gonna put us in a better position to produce that force. Now, if we think about posterior, so we have our hands on our hip and we lean back, so we're putting the hips into a posterior tilt, you can see how it's gonna be easier to go into knee flexion, which is gonna be lifting that knee up to our chest. Now, if we're standing forward and then we think about shifting our hips to the side, you can feel how naturally it's gonna be easier to lift your leg up into abduction so putting your legs out to the side think about like someone doing a kick in uh martial arts that's high up to the side where they're going to be laterally moving their hip and adducting or sorry abducting their legs away from each other okay just like with the scapula only it's a lot simpler in that we're just shifting the angle of the hip in order to get into a better position to produce force now when it comes to flexion, so that's gonna be lifting the knee up, that is coming from mostly our iliacus and our psoas, and we're gonna find our psoas has got some major flaws of how it's set up in the body, because it's literally inserting into your spine. So whenever you lift your knee, it shears your spine forward, which is obviously not a great thing. Then we're going to go ahead and have our TFL. So if you think about standing up, guys, lifting your leg up, Put your hand right on the outside of your thigh, right near your hip, and you're gonna feel that little ball of muscle. That's your TFL. We've got a rectus femoris, which is part of our quadricep. Hence, if you straighten your leg and lift it, you're gonna feel that twitching a little bit more because it's technically, it is a two joint muscle, unlike the other three of those four muscles of our quadriceps that are just a one joint muscle. We have our sartorius, which is sometimes referred to as the cobbler muscle because it's gonna lift up and internally rotate the leg. And then, we're going to have the pectineus, which is a much smaller internal rotator that's not going to be contributing as much. Now, when we talk about the design issues, we can see the, the iliacus, which is a deep hip muscle, and that's really hard to get at if you want to have any type of release or trying to get that to feel better. But notice, guys, the psoas. Now, the psoas literally is going into the anterior portion of your lumbar spine. So when it contracts, it's literally pulling your lumbar forward and that's creating a shear force which obviously can lead to back pain now here's the problem is so like right now i'm standing up right now my hip flexors in theory are in a lengthened position and if i have tight hip flexors they're constantly pulling me forward which is constantly shearing my low back forward which is putting me into possibly lordosis but what it's definitely going to contribute to is low back pain and it turns out when you spend all day sitting, what do you think is happening to the resting length of your hip flexors? Exactly, Blaine, they're shortening. And it turns out most people that are working desk jobs or otherwise, all of that shortening is gonna be one thing that's contributing to back pain. And that's why doing movements like lunges, doing uh, movements like the couch stretch, uh, deep lunges, meaning in a, like in a knee on the ground, pushing your hips forward, those are all gonna be very useful ways to literally help lengthen those tissues up 
so that they're going to move like they're supposed to. And that's something to stay on top of because it turns out for you guys right now, and just go and throw in the chat about how many hours a day, especially since I imagine a lot of you guys are kind of on lockdown also, how many hours a day do you think you spend sitting? Whenever you're ready, guys, just go and throw up a number. So there's the sartorius. And we can see how that's going to help with hip flexion, but it's going across. And notice it's going from the lateral aspects of the thigh into the medial aspect of the knee. It's going to pull things through. That's not bad, I guess. Five hours isn't too bad. I guess there's only two people that, uh, that are actively listening. And I appreciate your contributions. Nice, Haley. So how many of you guys currently have, well, actually, well, the, the jobs you have and otherwise are, a lot of them are probably heavily altered, but what would you guys think of would be a profession where people spend pretty much their entire day sitting? A desk job, Indy. They could have a standing desk, Sydney. They could have a walking desk. You're right. That's going to be definitely a problem. And the other one that I would say is think about your average uh, trucker. Think about folks that effectively drive for a living, you know, or fly, you know, pilots also. They're spending most of their day in a seated position. And that's why a number of these people complain about things like back pain partially because you're not getting as much core activation, you're not doing as good job of controlling those forces, like we talked about in the previous chapters when the biomechanics of the spine from sitting. But notice also on top of that, you're shorting these muscles when you do stand up, it's pulling you forward and causing you to have naturally probably more shear because you're not able to get into a good, fully standing position. You already have, you have literally some built-in anterior pelvic tilt because of the tightness of your hips. So we then have the hip extensors. The major one is the glute max. This should be the biggest and thickest muscle on the human body for nearly every single person you're going to encounter. Now we then have our semitendinous, semimembranous, and our biceps femoris that are all going to go ahead and contribute also to hip extension. Now it's only the long head of the biceps femoris that's doing this, not the short head. But all the other, or all the muscles of the hamstrings are also going to be hip, or sorry, knee flexors. So they're going to be curling that knee up to her butt. <sighs> Blaine, absolutely correct. So sadly enough, both sadly enough and as a good sign, your body adapts to the demands placed upon it. And specifically, they're going to adapt to the uh, total amount of stimulus and the intensity of the stimulus. So for individuals that happen to spend a lot of time in seated positions, they should be, you know, yes, in a perfect world, you'd be taking a break every half hour to get up, walk around and stretch out, which turns out you don't really have that as a trucker. So instead, every night, every morning, having them literally trying to do something like the couch stretch. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and go and get into a position where we can see things a little bit better. So for the couch stretch, and this is something that you guys can do at home, and I would thoroughly suggest you go ahead and do, so is you're gonna take a chair, turn it sideways, and from here, feel free to laugh, because if I fall, you guys are gonna get a pretty good gaff out of it. I'm gonna set, and I'm set, and oh, sweet Jesus, and I'm gonna go ahead and try to be tall. And so this is what's known as the couch stretch, because I've got my leg into effectively extension, you see, I got the extension of the hip, so I'm getting deep into, and I can feel that very angrily right now in what's going to be more my ilius and definitely my psoas because they're both really tight. You see, I'm naturally compensating. If I lean forward, the stretch isn't so bad, but every time I go and try to extend that hip, I'm going to get into that position a lot more, and that's something anybody can do from home to try to really put some time into it in order to help lengthen those tissues back to where they need to be. Because once again, we're going to keep moving in the direction of whatever stimulus we're getting the most uh, consistently. Now, to be fair, um, because I've been pretty bored 
um, for my conditioning at the end of my workout and is it by no means, actually give it a shot if you guys uh, want, Blaine, I think this would be pretty good for you, is I just went out to uh, the football field, social distancing. I saw some other people out there. We made sure we talked at a distance, but squatting down from the couch stretch position. Yes. Yeah. I'm right there. I was wound up about as tight as I could go. A, cause the chair is, it's a pretty high chair. Like my feet don't touch the ground when I'm sitting on this one. Hence why typically with the couch stretch, you literally put your knee onto a couch that you're sitting on. So that way it's naturally lower so you can be into a more comfortable position and then you can squat down and let yourself relax into it as far as you can. Um, but uh, give it a shot, Blaine. Let me know how it goes. Of Went out to the football field and Jasper actually from the rec, uh, he and I uh, ran into him and he and I lunged uh, 400 yards um, together and my hips felt really good, like opened up at the end. Whereas my musculature was pretty wrecked, and today it's definitely pretty Tyrannosaurus wrecked uh, from doing that volume of work after doing my heavy lifting. So, when we're talking about hip extension, remember guys, the glute max, and then the long head of the biceps femoris, and then the other semitendinous and semimembranous whenever we're looking at our hamstrings and their contributions. Now, the glute max, that's gonna be the most powerful one and that's the one that's gonna be turning on when you are doing, as I would call it, awesome things. If you guys have never had a, like a legitimate glute pump before from doing things like really hard sprinting, uh, really you could do uh, hill sprints, doing high rep and very low depth squatting, uh, same thing with doing deadlifting, I would say you're missing out, but maybe not because it is really uncomfortable, but that's going to be when you're really getting your glutes to fire and do something. Now, for the most part, me just standing here isn't really too much on glute tone. Like, you know, I can feel that my glutes really aren't turned on in order to keep me standing up, but it's my hamstrings that have got some static uh, contraction in order to keep my hips extended and keep me standing upwards. So... Like anything else, if you really want to get glute activation, you got to get people to do things in that. So then in order to get ourselves into that abduction, lifting the leg out to the side, we've got our glute medius, which is going to be on top, and that's going to be the major mover, along with the glute minimus right underneath it. Now, by abducting, it's important not just for trying to lift your leg out to the side, but it's really important also for the gait cycle, in that literally every time you take a step, your hip on the side that you have the leg off the ground is trying to fall to the ground. So you have to literally use that glute medius and glute minimus to keep your legs level. And it's even more important in sport in that literally glute medius weakness has been related to increased risks of ACL tears because the knee can buckle in because they don't have the strength to go ahead and abduct the knee to keep it in a straight line with how we're trying to apply force. The other one being the hamstrings. And we're gonna learn about that from how they stabilize when we get to the knee joint. Now, we then have our adductors. Now, the magnus, longus, and brevis are gonna be the big three that are really pulling our legs together. But our gracilis is gonna be co contributing a little bit, but since it's much longer and specifically much thinner, it's not giving as great as, uh, as great a force production. And so if you look at the image all the way on the right, you can really see how all those move together, along with you get some help from the, pu uh, from the pectineus which remember also is gonna be slightly assisting with hip flexing. Now, the next group of muscles that you guys need to know about is what's known as our pelvic floor. So this is effectively the angle of, from the floor looking up into the body. Oh, sorry, sorry, this is superior. This is from, from the top of the head on down on the bottom. Now you can see how we have our iliacus, and our psoas muscles running through, but then, guys, we've got our pubic, uh, pubic, uh, pubicalgeus and our iliococcygeus musculature, which is literally what's making up our pubic floor. Now, why do we need to know about our pelvic floor muscles? What, why are they important? Why are our pelvic floor muscles important?
anybody. You can unmute yourself and say something, or you can just go ahead and just put a comment below. Exactly, Kylie. All of our organs are literally trying to fall out the bottom of us. So our pelvic floor is helping keep everything from falling through, 100%. Now, the issue with these muscles is like anything else, they do need a certain amount of strength and stability. They need to have a certain length. We don't want them to be, for lack of a better, we don't want them to be torn, definitely, and we don't want them to be too loose. Because what's going to happen to somebody if their pelvic floor musculature isn't as strong as it should be? What's going to be probably one of the first way that it shows itself? Yep. Yep. It's not so much no control over your ability to, you know, urinate or you might be, you know, pooping yourself on occasion, but this would be individuals that pee themselves a little bit whenever they try to jog or jump or move. And quite frequently it happens to women more than men, specifically women that have given uh, birth and through traditional, you know, vaginal delivery. And because, like anything else, these muscles can be torn and they can be overstretched, it's never, ever normal to pee yourself a little bit when you just do normal activities of daily life. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have held it for too darn long, like, yeah, that can happen just through the pressure. But otherwise, your pelvic floor needs a certain amount of strength. And you guys, have, have you guys ever heard of kegels before? Because if I can avoid going into talking about what that is, I'm pretty okay with that. Actually, we'll do it this way. If you don't know what kegels are, I'll go ahead and just put that down in the chat, and then I'll go ahead and talk about what they are. Awesome. Okay, no one has any questions. So, like anything else, there literally are certain biomechanists and therapists that actually help people strengthen their pelvic floor through giving them exercises, along with on occasion, people actually have to have them surgically essentially repaired due to the tearing otherwise it can happen during the trauma that can be childbirth, depending on obviously a number of things about how the female is built, how developed, with, how big the, the child is and so on. But once again, guys, you're not quite frequently thinking about these muscles, but they're incredibly important. And then if we aren't taking care of them, we aren't making sure that we've got good control and otherwise, that can show itself up in a number of issues. And as you would possibly think, you can also get to a point where the musculature is too, um, too tight for a better term, and that can have issues with not just, uh, let's simply say bowel movements, but also recreationally, uh, recreational use of that area. So oh, now if we have the same thing and we're looking from the bottom, you can literally see how pretty much the underside of your body is being controlled by just musculature. And if those, yes, I know tanks, if those muscles are not strong enough, we can go ahead and have a number of issues with essentially incontinence. And that's, that's nothing I want to wish on anybody. And I definitely have had uh, friends and parents of friends that literally like, their mom doesn't run anymore because she pees herself every time she jogs unless she has a completely empty bladder. So what her option is to try to run while she's dehydrated so she doesn't have to pee or not run at all. And that's just not a good way to live. So keep in mind, guys, these muscles, though very small, are very important for quality of life. Oh, also, if you guys want, I'll tell you a good way to always get space in a weight room if somebody wants to work in with you but someone's gonna to have to comment that they want the story. So we then have what's known as our lateral rotators, okay? This is what's going to be outwardly rotating our femur slightly when we're also lifting that pelvis. Now when we talk about lateral, it's going out to the start. Okay, so if you want people to leave you alone when you're squatting or lifting weights and they're kind of being like, can I work in with you? Like, yeah, man, it's no worries, I'm just supersetting. 
And when they're like, what are you supersetting with? And then you just say, I'm supersetting with kegels. And you just kind of like twitch your face a little bit while you're making hard eye contact with them. I find people usually leave you alone if you do that, but then it can really backfire in that some people like that eye contact when you're making that face. And then you probably need to leave. Okay. Now we're also getting this rotation naturally when we're doing things like squatting all the way through a full range of motion and that we're going to have to be laterally and rotating that knee, keeping it outside and not allowing the hips or specifically the knees to collapse inwards through medial rotation. Now, when it comes to that internal rotation, most of this is being done by the gluteus minimus, but we are still getting assistance also from our TFL from the outside, along with our semi-tendinous and semi-membranous, so two of the muscles of our hamstring and that glute medius. Now, these are typically only one third the strength. So our internal rotation is naturally not meant to be as strong as our lateral rotation, so our turning out of the hips. We then have horizontal adduction and horizontal abduction. So that's gonna be when we have our knee at more of a 90 degree angle. We have our leg up at a 90 degree angle. So adduction and abduction going through. So when we're going for abduction, that's gonna be that TFL along with the glute medius and glute minimus. And notice that's gonna be even more important because when is the hip naturally in a horizontal abducting and adducting position? When is this naturally occurring? Not bad, not bad. Yeah, that's true if you're sitting down on the ground. Absolutely, Kylie. Think about sport though, guys. Think about sport and physical activity. When does horizontal abduction and adduction become far more important? Yes, change of direction and or being in the bottom of a lunge, being in the bottom of a squat. So when we're in those bent positions, that's where you're at the greatest risk of getting injured. So we need to make sure that we've got really good horizontal abduction and adduction so that we can make sure that our knee and our hip is in alignment. Because what we can have an issue with is if we're in that bent position and I'm buckled in, well, now I've got this shear on the inside of my knee. Just like if I'm rotating the other way, now I've got that shear on the lateral. But if I have that force going straight down through the leg, that's where I'm not only gonna be able to produce the most force, that's the most efficient, but I'm also keeping my knee joint safe. Because one thing we're gonna find, guys, is just like with the upper body, it's a kinetic chain. So whatever I'm doing with my hand, I can then, if my hand is fixed, I've got that plane where my elbow's at. Now, if I've got my elbow out hard to the side, internally rotated, that's not a safe of a position for me to push through as if I have my elbow underneath me in a straight line with my shoulder. The same is to be said with our hip joint and how that's going to move as we're going and putting our knee in a position where it's trying to have to rotate. And your hip is meant to be a mobility joint, has obviously a lot of different degrees of motion can. And same thing with the ankle joint that we're going to get to later. Our knee is really meant to be just a hinge, just like our elbow is just meant to be a hinge. If we make our elbow also do lateral or medial movement, or movement, that's how we can dislocate our elbow. Or in the example of the knee, that's how we can tear the ACL, tear the MCL, or any other of those ligaments, depending on which way you stretch or stress that part of our body that's not prepared for it. Now, we constantly have a certain amount of load through the hip. Now, this all depends on what we're doing and it typically is gonna be compression. So when I'm walking around or just standing here, it turns out when you're on one leg, now I've got the weight of my entire torso and the leg that's off the ground all going through that one hip. Mind you, the thigh, the shank, and the foot of the other leg is not going through it. 
When I'm going up a flight of stairs, I'm going to have an increase because now I'm lifting my body. But when I'm going down a flight of stairs, it's going to be even so a little bit higher. And that's because of the compression, because of the added impacts of having our body lower itself through. And that's not even talking about things like sprinting. That's not even talking about things like heavy lifting. So when we start moving and when we are running at 3.5 meters per second, uh, that's going to convert to about, if I remember correctly, I guess closer to about probably nine or 10 miles an hour. So you're going at a decent clip. And notice, guys, you've got a little over five times your body weight going through those hips. And when you have someone doing something really powerful, like a dive in soccer, we can be getting closer to things like 10 times body weight. And so we need to be mindful of strengthening all these muscles in the hip, specifically our ability to absorb the force. And mostly we're really looking at the extensor strength, not so much the hip flexor strength. And how, what type of footwear you're wearing, along with are you carrying something unilaterally are going to also influence the amount of force that's going through there is. Are the kids starving, honey? Yes. Our cats have a giant container full of food and if they can ever see the bottom, they start singing us the songs of their people for fear that they might not ever eat again. So that's why they give Lauren trouble the second she gets up. Norbert didn't even get up until, uh, he didn't come down with me. He was, he was so happy to be laying up in bed with mommy. Not in bed, that dog does not sleep in bed with us. Because I already know I would be the one that had to sleep on the floor if Norbert got up there. So, force equals mass times acceleration. So if we're moving ourselves at a greater speed, we're dealing with greater accelerations. And our mass is gonna be staying the same because it's the same size person we're moving. So as we're going faster and faster, we're going to be dealing with greater forces in the hip. Now, the smoother our gait is, the less of oscillation we're gonna have, kind of that bouncy gait you see from people that aren't very good at running, the less force that we're gonna to have to deal with. And so, for example, we don't wanna be landing on our heel in general when we're running. We wanna be landing on the ball of our foot. The reason for it is now the ankle can absorb force along with the knee, along with the hip. It's thanks to wearing shoes that people typically have a longer stride length, so they have got a bigger impact. If you are barefoot running, you find that you have a faster turnover, but you're taking smaller strides, so you're absorbing less force per foot strike because we're not trying to cover a greater amount of distance each time, along with we're using the ankle as a force absorbing a, a joint, as opposed to trying to treat it like it's effectively a paddle and we're using just our knee and our hip because we're landing hard on that ankle. Now, some common injuries we're gonna have is literally those hip fractures. So we talked about it earlier where we can have that break, typically up in the femoral neck. Now this is usually when you hear about somebody's grandmother fell and broke her hip or somebody's parent uh, mother fell and broke their hip. And that's literally a breaking of this. Now what's even more terrifying is with folks that have really bad osteoporosis, they actually don't break their hip on the landing, they broke their hip falling to the ground because they try to catch themselves. And when they try to catch themselves, the strength of their muscles was literally stronger than what their bones could handle and they literally break their own bone. Now, you can have contusions, so that's going to be on the front side from literally impacts in sport. You can have strains in a variety of different muscles because of, turns out, the really high demands and the high speed eccentrics that are going to happen when you're trying to bring your leg through and deaccelerate when you're sprinting at high speeds. And then you can also have some adductor issues. Now, what's really interesting is once an athlete has had a really bad hamstring strain, pull, or tear, they're far more likely to tear it again. Does anyone have a guess why that really has an increased risks of recurrence?
you guys can sit over chat or you guys can just go ahead and actually be involved in deacceleration. Yes, hamstrings are involved in deacceleration, but why after you've strained those muscles once, are you more likely to strain them again? Exactly, Kylie. The problem is once you tear muscles that normally have really good linear organization, you're going to start to see that some of the scar tissue that you lay down actually lays itself down asymmetrically. So then when we're pulling it, we're constantly pulling this point of weakness as opposed to being on the straight line. We're now having the acute, so now we're more likely to literally re-injure that area. So that's why when an athlete has a really bad hamstring strain, it's very important to really help them re-educate and make sure that they're doing some movements in order to make sure that that scar tissue is laying itself down as correctly as it can. Because like anything else, if we have that little bit of a discrepancy, every time we pull, we create a shear on the one part of the scar tissue, which is more likely to tear itself again in the future. So now we come down to the knee joint. Okay, this is what's known as the tibiofemoral joint. So tibia being the bottom side, femur being the top side. Now we do have what's known as condyloid articulations between our medial and lateral condyles, which is really just the medial and lateral sides of our femur and our tibia. This creating this hinge joint, but it's also giving a great amount of surface area. So there's a lower amount of pressure that's going to be occurring in this area. Now we also have our patella, which is going to be linking on the front between itself and the femur. Now, the advantage or the reason we have a patella is it gives us a much greater mechanical advantage for our quadriceps because it literally increases that angle that they're pulling from. So if you didn't have a patella, you would have a decreased angle at the knee joint, which in turn would cause a decreased amount of force production with the same amount of muscle mass. Now, we then have our meniscus, and these are going to be those pads that are further increasing the surface area between our tibia and femur, which is going to allow for better force distribution, so we're going to be able to tolerate a greater amount of loading. Now, these meniscus are also going to be very close to being linked in to are cruciate ligaments, which is part of the reason why when people tear their ACL or their PCL, typically the ACL, they can have an increased risk of tearing their meniscus. And then same thing if they tear their MCL, tearing also part of that medial meniscus. So when those tears occur, they can happen in a variety of different ways. This can cause people's knees to lock or catch, which sometimes needs surgical intervention. Sometimes will actually heal on their own as long as they're given enough time and they're not doing anything that's causing a greater amount of damage to those tissues. Now, same thing with the hip. We also, in the knee, have a number of bursa that are serving effectively as padding between both the knee joint or the bones, the tendons, the ligaments, and the muscle to allow things to move a little bit more easier. Now, we have our collateral ligaments. These are going to be on the outsides of the knees, so the medial and the subosomal going on my right knee. We've got my MCL, so the medial collateral ligament, and then my LCL, my lateral collateral ligament that's stabilizing on the outside. But then on the inside, we have our cruciate ligaments and we have our anterior and our posterior. Now they actually twist as they come through each other, which we're going to find is a bit of a design flaw, which can lead to some issues. Now, one small muscle that's easy to overlook is what's known as the popliteus. This is going to be the muscle that's going to go ahead and contract to initially unlock the knee when it happens to be in a fully extended position. And then from there, the vast majority of the knee flexor work is being done by the muscles of the hamstring. And then we're gonna learn that gastroc is also contributing to a very lesser extent, but still some extent. So, we do have a little bit through the gracilis, the sartorius, and the popliteus. Don't worry about the amount of popliteus is really just helping unlock 
Now in rodents, it's going to be a lot more important, but humans, not so much. So our biceps femoris, where the long head is the only one that's a two joint, the short head is the single joint, and then our semitendinous and semimembranous are both going to be two joint muscles. So not just giving us knee flexion, but also hip extension. We then have our gastroc, and we can see how that is actually has an origin in the posterior uh, component of our femur, and then all the way through into our, uh, yeah, our Achilles tendon if we want to, but really we're just talking about our calcaneus tendon. And then you can see how the popliteus is gonna help unlock through twisting, but it's not giving a whole lot of knee flexor ability. So what's really fascinating is with our knee flexors, we're gonna find that gastroc is helping contribute to it and then also plantar flexing, so lifting ourselves up. This is going to be a two joint muscle and specifically really important for power production. And it typically when you actually biopsy it is much more heavily type two muscle fiber. Whereas our soleus itself is more about maintaining posture and holding positions. And that we find is much more aerobically. So you literally, if you look at somebody's calves, you can sometimes get some good information as to what type of training are they doing. So my wife, for example, over there, when, we were doing marathon training and everything else. She used to love to tease me about how much bigger her calves were than mine because I obviously woefully neglect them in the gym. But secondarily is she always would have a lot more soleus development because she was doing a lot of aerobic style work. Whereas what little calf development I had was mostly gastroc because that was due to doing Olympic lifting, um, cheerleading and other types of power activities. So that was a musculature in my lower leg being that was being much more heavily activated recruited and then in turn damage, which is going to then lead to the hypertrophy response. Is that, is that fair, honey, or am I giving it an unfair? Mm -hmm. she, she does exist. She just, you know, doesn't like my lunacy sometimes. All right. What's that? It's, it's my day off. I don't want to deal with you. She's unfortunately still has to go into work at uh, the health department for uh, Jessamine County which you know, is good because they're making sure that people are still getting their WIC benefits and everything else. So the kids are getting food and so on. It's just, they literally had, was it three times as many appointments this past week? What's that? Huh? Yeah. It was still like three times the normal amount of appointments. So yeah, she's a, uh, she's a little done with that. Now we have our knee extensors. So we're talking about the four muscles of our quads our rectus femoris, which remember is gonna be the one that's also working as a hip flexor, but then we've got our vastus medialis, sometimes it's referred to as the VMO. We've got our vastus lateralis, which is obviously gonna be the outside, and then our vastus intermedius. Now what's really important, guys, is look at the angle of pull. So the vastus intermedius is, and the rectus femoris are pulling in that straight line, but notice the vastus medialis is definitely pulling out and more medially the kneecap. And the vastus lateralis is pulling the kneecap laterally. So if you have an imbalance in lateralis strength to medialis strength, you're actually going to have issues with knee pain because you're constantly tracking the literal patella into one of the aspects of the feet, or effectively where it tracks through the femur than it should. So it's either grinding on the medial side more than it should, or the lateral side more than it should. So when you look at somebody's quads, you should see pretty fair and even development between their vastus medialis on the inside and their vastus lateralis on the outside. And if you don't, that's something that's worth looking into and figuring out what can you do to try to assess it. And that's talking about more physical therapy style training. And that's where you see things like VMO acti uh, activation exercises like terminal knee extensions and or a Peterson step ups in order to help make sure that that is going to be tracking appropriately and is developed like it should be. Now, we then have the ankle itself, okay? This is mostly a hinge, but we are also going to have eversion and inversion. So it, it functions more like a limited ball and socket than a true hinge joint once we really get everything involved because the ankle is insanely complex. It's made up of, or the ankle and the foot is made up of, if I remember correctly, it's about 24 different bones, but they actually all inter- uh, interface in such a way that you end up with 36 joints. So thinking of the ankle is just paddle that go down and up. So plantar flexion and then dorsiflexion, 
is incredibly simplistic. We have a lot of actions that are going to occur at the ankle. And if we've got really good eversion, inversion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, that's going to allow us to keep that knee in a safer position, especially if we have appropriate mobility in the hip. So our athletes are not only going to be able to perform better, change direction more aggressively, they're also going to be less likely to injure themselves. So we have the distal tibiofibular joint, and this is going to be where effectively we have really, really strong fibrous tissue. So this is more of our ligaments that are keeping our tibia and fibula together. So you can see how those two are combining right here. Then we are going to have our talus and then our calcaneus, and we can see how they kind of rest above one another. Now, in order to get dorsiflexion, so that's going to be lifting our foot up towards ourselves, we're getting most of this from our tibialis anterior, but then you're also getting some uh, use from our extensor digitorum longus, so that is actually lifting your toes up and opening them to a certain extent. We have our peroneus tertius, which we're going to have in the uh, lateral aspect that's going to be rolling it out. So that also is helping a little bit with what is going to be inversion, not eversion. And then we have our extensor holicus longus, and that's specifically working on lifting our big toe up. Now for the plantar flexors, notice guys, we got the gastroconsolidus. So as you suspect, just like the difference between our hip flexors and hip extensors, our plantar flexors should be far, far stronger typically at least a three to one ratio than our plantar flexors. And if you haven't noticed in the gym, people train their plantar flexors, but you rarely see any types of dorsiflexion machines because it turns out it's usually not the limiting factor for folks when it comes to the performance. Now, notice you do have the tibialis uh, posterior, plantaris, pronius longus, flexor hallucus longus, pronius brevis, and flexor digitorum longus that are all also contributing to plantar flexion, but the lion's share of the work is being done by the gastroc and soleus. So we then have the subtalar joint. So we've got the talus and the calcaneus. That's where we're going to be getting most of our inversion and eversion from. So how we're going to be able to roll our ankle to one side or the other. Now, this is sometimes also referred to as pronation of the foot with eversion. So think about pushing your big toe down and then supination or inversion, we're gonna be lifting that foot up. Now, this is important because we are going to get pronation when we're in dorsiflexion, so when we're lifting our leg up, and then we should get supination or inversion when we're pushing our foot down into the ground. So your feet are naturally gonna cycle as we're going and walking. So you're gonna see that we have this lifting and lowering. That's normal. And if we are doing a really good job of it, it's gonna help with not just force production, but also with receiving force. So here's an example of individuals that have excessive pronation. So you can see how they have that eversion, that rolled ankle in, and you can see with that asymmetrical force production, we're gonna have more issues with the lateral aspect of the leg, which in turn is gonna track itself through issues with the knee and potentially even issues with the hip and the low back because we're gonna be rolled in and buckled in, so we're gonna be slanting the one side. Okay. Then the same thing can be said if we happen to have too much supination. So we're going to be outside. We're going to be in what's known as, as uh, varus, or our knees are actually pushed laterally. And then, where is the inversion inversion important? Literally when you're running. When you're running and trying to change direction, it's incredibly important. So if someone isn't, okay, so you see the example of supination? You naturally want to have supination in your foot if you're trying to effectively change direction specifically for your leg that is out laterally to the body. So we want to go ahead and supinate that foot so we get better traction and better force absorption. Just like we're going to want to have inversion if we happen to have that leg underneath us and we're trying to push ourselves off going in the lateral direction. So we naturally need to be able to cycle through these and effectively have better ankle range of motion so we can have that flat ground and running. In fact, let me see if I can show you guys a really good. Really good picture from back in the day with uh, the football player Barry Sanders. Where, oh, yeah. Yeah, that dude was just 
stupid agile. Okay, you guys, look at how far he was able to go ahead and rotate that ankle. So this would be going with that effective, his right leg going across his body. God, that's so weird. But he has insane amounts of pronation so that he's able to go ahead and get better traction and change of direction. Now, also Barry Sanders was like insanely strong and insanely powerful. And he's actually one of the athletes that retired where most people argued he walked away when he was still at the high point of his career. He literally had, uh, supposedly he was a 600 pound back squatter for reps. So turns out having really good ability to move your foot and orient it is important once again for health of the entire kinetic chain but also for high level performance. And what's one of the issues we find in a lot of sport? We specifically look at our football team. Every single kid's ankles are taped. Every single, some of them are even spatted. So their ankles taped, then they're put in their shoe or their cleat, and then they're taped on top of that. So effectively, their ankle is like wearing a damn boxing glove. They can't actually move it anymore. So now you're taking away from range of motion, which literally is gonna be taking away from potential ability to change direction and to move more efficiently. But to be fair, that's just logic. Not everybody's all up on that. And I've gone over because remember, I pushed the wrong button this morning and then thankfully found out I wasn't talking to myself because that would have been depressing. Yeah, I hit the bioenergetics le lecture button, not the biomechanics. Yeah, exactly. I was like, man, nobody's showing up. I guess these kids, they, they took the exam and they're like, you know what? This guy, I'm not going to deal with this. I'll just watch it later on YouTube. Any questions, guys, or anything else you guys would like me to go through? Are you guys, are you guys doing okay? Because I know this isn't too fun. Would you, I don't think you mentioned before, this is taken. So the first really big key is to make sure that they've got good neurological control and then muscular development. So this is something you start in January for the sport of American football. So literally that whole like, I'm king for the day, here's what I do. My initial come back and start training with me plan all of our warm-ups and our low level change of direction work is all done barefoot. So they have to learn how to use and appropriately innervate. And then we're going to be doing barefoot work along with doing work with cleats and otherwise, once we go further into the spring semester, but we're doing things specifically to help strengthen the ankles and also to improve the neurological control. So for me, that's where I would start with my athletes of making sure that they can use and innervate their ankles appropriately. Now, don't get me wrong, you can tear the ligaments in your ankle so they no longer work like they're supposed to. Who's that sound like, honey? Well, no, my, my, uh, my wife's as stubborn as I am, um, which is both good and bad on occasion. And so, what were you, what year in college were you, honey? I don't know if they can hear you too well, but I'm, they can definitely hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Now on occasion when we're walking, her ankle will just effectively dislocate for a second. And then I'll just hear a whump and then turn around and she's on the ground. And I'm like, Like it's happened, it's happened enough now that it's just kind of like, okay, I'll give you a minute and you'll be fine. But the first couple of times, like we were just hiking and then all of a sudden she was on the ground. And I was like, and so in those situations, that's where you do need a brace because it turns out the natural anatomical brace isn't there anymore. Now, another thing to think about guys, whenever we're talking about ankle stability with our athletes or just people in general, and this is going to be one that hopefully makes sense to you guys pretty quickly is think about the length of the lever arm. Okay. What can we do to increase the length of the lever arm at the ankle joint that in turn is going to massively increase our risk of injuring our ankle. And it's, it's a form of footwear.
Yes, heels. So by having a heel in your shoe, it's elevating that ankle, so it's increasing that lever arm. So now we can deal with a greater amount. And I'm sure if any of you guys have ever seen somebody walk for the first time in like a real steep pair of stilettos and you see that ankle just like out to the side, and it's just, oh God, oh God, no, 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 no. Well, most of our tennis shoes, guys, have about a one inch heel in them. Some of them are a little bit thicker than that. And same thing when we're talking about sporting cleats and otherwise. So your goal, the reason that heel is there is for padding and then also to maybe make you feel a little bit taller. If you minimize that heel, so it's more about having, you know, still some support for the foot, but having the foot be strong enough, now we've decreased the lever arm, which now you decrease the potential issues for things like sprains because we're not going to be able to evert or invert as aggressively because we don't have this giant heel underneath that's increasing that lever arm and in turn increasing the torque that we're experiencing in that joint. So. Any other questions? And we'll just go ahead and stop here and we'll take over here on uh, Thursday. You guys good? Questions, comments, concerns? No worries, Blaine. So guys, have a great morning. Be safe out there. Um, talk with other humans maintain social distancing, and um, yeah, have a great day, guys. I will see you guys on Thursday when I hopefully push the right button. Hopefully. All right, bye-bye.